Welcome to session 54 in the Worlds of Speculative Fiction series. This time we are continuing what we started in the previous session, looking at the second volume of the World of Tears series by Philip Jose Farmer. And that is three novels, just like the previous one was, Behind the Walls of Terra, The Lavalite World, and the conclusion of the series, more than fire. You can get them all in one single omnibus volume. They've been bundled together that way in edition after edition. And each of these is a different kind of novel in a different setting. They're all in the same basic narrative universe. I'm using the word universe there in a very inclusive way, as we'll see, because pocket universes are one of the key thematics of the setting of these, and indeed of, of, you might say, the grand plot as well. So we're going to look at a number of different philosophical themes that come up in this and the world building that Philip Jose Farmer is engaged in. We'll also talk about characters and plot and how he's going to bring these to a successful conclusion. We don't need to do an awful lot in the way of biography because we've already devoted two full sessions to Philip Jose Farmer, one very early on in the second year of this series and another one just uh, a month ago. I should tell those who aren't familiar with this series what it's all about. So this is a series that I started back in 2016 when we moved uh, back here from New York to Milwaukee, and I partnered with the Brookfield Public Library to do in-person sessions focusing on speculative fiction, on world building, and philosophical themes. So after an initial session, which was devoted to just talking about, you know, what is the nature of speculative fiction? What does it include? Differences between fantasy and science fiction and some other genres and, and you know, talking about what the series was going to do. We jumped in looking at Tolkien and Lewis and Van Vogt and a whole bunch of other people concluding the year with, if I remember right, talking about George R. R. Martin because, you know, Game of Thrones based on his Song of Ice and Fire was, was a big deal. And I was invited back to continue the series. For me, it was about a way in which I could do some guilty pleasure reading, return to narrative universes and series that I had remembered liking back in the day and, and reconsidering them uh, from a number of different perspectives. And we had a lot of great engagement and dialogue about what was going on. We continued year after year after year until the COVID pandemic hit. And then after a number of months of not doing anything with the series, I decided to resuscitate it in this current form where I produce a video and talk about all these things uh, directly to uh, an audience. And then we have a session afterwards to discuss the matters. So this time around, we are finishing up with Philip Jose Farmer. I will tell you that myself. I first encountered Philip Jose Farmer, I believe in middle school, and it wasn't the World of Tears series, it was instead the Riverboat and some of his short stories collections and um, some of the other novels that he'd written. And I very much enjoyed it. And then in high school, I found the World of Tears at the Waukesha Public Library read my way through them, found them, you know, quite interesting, and uh, I enjoyed them quite a bit. So I thought it would be great to come back to this. Philip Jose Farmer is really known for a wide range of stuff, but I, I'll say that there's three big series that he's probably best known for. One of them is the Day World series. Another is the... Um, stuff having to do with with the river world you know there's a whole set of novels really excellent stuff that i i think there and then it's the world of tears so we're going to delve into this and uh, with no further ado let's talk a little bit about biography these books coming out and um, some of the reception of them 
By the time that the first entries in this series, the Maker of Universes, Gates of Creation, A Private Cosmos are being written, the ones that we find in Volume 1 of this collection, Philip Jose Farmer was a pretty well-established sci-fi author, and he's still working regular jobs at the same time, but he's moving more and more towards becoming, a, a, you know, an author full time. These other three novels in the series are a bit more spread out. So the first one, um, which is um, Behind the Walls of Terra, is 1970. The previous ones were 1965. Uh, 1966 and then 1968 so he's bringing these books out fairly quickly and he's writing other things at the same time 1970 he publishes a lot of different books there's behind the walls of Terra, lord of the trees the mad goblin lord tiger the stone god and the stone god Awakens, and he's also working on the things that are going to go into the probably more popular down the line River World series. In 1971, he's going to publish To Your Scattered Bodies Go, The Fabulous River Boat, and then another book, Down the Black Gang. And um, also important in 1970, the farmers moved back to Peoria, um, you know, important place. For, for Philip Jose Farmer, Peoria, Illinois, just actually south of here, not too far. I've had relatives who've lived there and passed through there many times uh, myself. And so what we've got here with the first book in this second you know, trio, second trilogy, uh, Behind the Walls of Terra, is he's writing it at a time that a lot of stuff is going on. It's in, in some ways, continuing the story of the world of tears in a way that makes good sense. We'll talk about I exactly what's happening with setting, but Terra, the mention of that, that, that's Earth, right? So the previous books are set in other places other than when Wolf leaves Earth in the first few chapters of the first one. The Lavalite world is going to wait a while before it's coming out. So that is 1977. Um, now, there, there was a bit of writer's block that Farmer experienced, but it, it wasn't that much of a writer's block since he's publishing quite a few things in the intermediary time, including um, Tarzan Alive, uh, Doc Savage, His Apocalyptic Life, um, uh, Venus on the Half Shell, all sorts of other, you know, interesting works. The Lavalite World is going to get published in 1977 uh, at the same time as The Dark Design. So he's taking back up the River World series, and we see him churning those out. 1979, River World and Other Stories. 1980, The Magic Labyrinth, River World War, The Suppressed Fiction of Philip Jose Farmer. And in the early 80s, more of the River World series. When is um, the last installation, More Than Fire, going to come out? Well, that's going to wait a while. And actually, he, he writes another book in the intermediary time that there's a little bit of debate about whether it belongs in this series or not. It's called Red Orc's Rage, and it is using the previous five books in this World of Tears series as part of the narrative universe, but as a narrative universe, as a fantasy uh, role-playing thing um, for this other novel, which is based, interestingly enough, on some work that was being done by a therapist using Philip Jose Farmer's stuff. We're going to put Red Oryx Rage aside. I just want to mention, though, when does that actually come out? 1991. So big you know, gap between 1977 and 1991. More Than Fire is coming out in 1993. So you know, a different era, a different uh, time, more than a decade intervening. The other thing that I'll point out, too, is that these books are a little bit longer 
Um, the, the entire volume is still only uh, 544 pages. So each of these is, uh, you know, shorter than, than the other, than, than many other books, but they're longer than the other World of Tears books. And this volume actually begins with um, More Than Fire on page 329. So, you know, it's, it's probably the longer one in this bunch, and there's a lot going on in there. Now, interestingly enough, these books were not all that well received. And I, I do want to look at some of the reception because I think it's, it, it's interestingly setting a, a stage. Before that, though, I just want to bring up one thing from the Pilgrimage to Peoria uh, that has Philip Jose Farmer being interviewed. He said uh, in the interview, uh, you mentioned in 1990 that the Tears series would probably be two more books, Kikhaka's World and the conclusion of the series, The Garden of Evil. Since then, you wrote Red Oryx Rage and More Than Fire. How do these tie in with your original plans? Philip Jose Farmer says, I intended to then, but things change. You get new ideas. The titles of the first three World of Tears books were not mine. They were dreamed up by editor Don Wolheim. Kikaka's World was an idea and title I originally suggested for a private cosmos. And it's interesting because Kikaka ends up becoming, you know, really the most important main character. And this last book, More Than Fire, ends with a paragraph in which Kikaka is going to tell us something. I'll, I'll just read this to you. He would never again leave this world, the land area of which was larger than Earth's. To roam in it forever with Anana by his side would be to live in heaven. Though it would be unlike heaven in that it had a streak of hell and he could be killed. Ah, that gave it its savor. My world, he shouted. And while these words soared out over the planet, they were followed by a roar like a lion notifying everybody this was his territory. Kikaka's world. And that's, that's how Farmer ends this series with his protagonist, and many people believe, and Farmer himself admitted, his alter ego, the person he kind of would like to be, this trickster Kikaka, um, expressing the, how this narrative universe and this particular pocket universe created by Wolf, uh, ruled by, you know, him uh, as his friend, one of the lords, is now Kikaka's world. And, and it's really quite emblematic because Kikaka really does take over the series, doesn't he, right? From book three onward and, and then all the way to the end, he is the one who's, who's really driving the story. Anyway, coming back to this, so Farmers asked, so is the Tears series finished? And Farmer says, yes, I think I've mined that vein. I have too many other things to write and not enough time left. And this is, you know, um, he's, he's, he's saying this after the publication of More Than Fire in 1993. He's going to die in Peoria in 2009. So, you know, fairly prescient about this. He has another, you know, another... Uh, 16, 15 years left, um, but he had a lot of other things that he was working on. Now, I want to tell you about some of these reviews. They're rather mixed, and I kind of suspect that it's because people were looking for something that they saw in the original volumes that they weren't seeing in these newer volumes. And I think it's a really good question to open up for those who ha in fact have read these books, whether these reviews are reflective of the objective quality of these works, or maybe there's something else going on there. So Behind, behind the Walls of Terra, um, 1970, right? Here's one review. Uh, the result is a lively enough action story, but if you've read the earlier books, you're bound to miss the trickster character that made the original Kikaka so attractive. He was the Loki of Farmer's Asgard, and now he seems to have diminished into just another vigorous hero. Maybe he's just resting between exploits. Isn't that an interesting suggestion? 
Um, here's another one that's a little bit less sanguine. A novel that is essentially one extended chase scene with hero and heroine attempting to outrun and outwit a bunch of hired guns directed by several immortals called lords who are somewhat inept secret masters. Good writing, excellent pacing, make it worth reading as an adventure story, but an overwhelming shallowness prevents it from being anything more than that. It has the additional curious flaw of not ending. It breaks off halfway down page 188, right in the middle of the action, uh, like a magazine serial. Right? Um, here's another review. This wasn't exactly a disappointment. The cover leads you to expect very little, and what you receive is a short step above this. Mr. Farmer has written many fine pieces in the past, but this continuation of the master, makers of universes could have used a long passage in the polish rewrite bin. And then he says, to counter that, though, some of the ideas have fascinating possibilities, but just aren't developed or utilized to my taste. My intuition signals that this was a rush job. Um, another one. There you have it, and I hope you're as dismayed as you should be. Um, uh, one or the other had to writhe, and I'm afraid that in Behind the Walls, both fantasy and satire suffered horribly because Kikaka and his broad, one of the lords, were pretty shaggy characters, and the entire series is roughhouse anyway. Farmer had to depict certain contemporary components of our society in a rather broad, satirical searchlight. Only it doesn't search... It just blinds, blinds Kikaka, and were we that naive, the readers, to the obvious complexities of said issues. He says, it's supposed to be satire, but it's so crude it rips up the ground before it gets near the target. And that's bad. That's reactionary. Frankly, even though you know what a misshot the product is from farmer's intent, that's disgusting. <laughs> so that's rather over the top, written you know, in 1971. It reminds me very much of the music critics who entirely dismissed heavy metal as it was developing and turning into one of the you know most resilient genres ever that these uh, and the bands that were being written about and, and written off right but there is something there is something uh, that we can put on the table. Are these a rush job that 's going to be a complaint made about some of the other novels as well. Is there a shallowness to this particular novel behind the walls of Terra? There's cool ideas being put out there. Are they being adequately developed and exploited? I'm going to say yes, and we'll see why in a bit, but I think some people just didn't see that at the time. Um, Lavalite World coming in seven years later. Um, Again, we see this this worry about editing. One of the uh, reviewers said it's a fast-moving Burroughs-type adventure, which reads like somewhat sloppy first draft. Another wrote uh, in his, this final novel, Lavalite World, Kikaka is battling the Lord Urthona and battling the landscape of the planet, which is in constant turmoil, which is kind of a cool idea. He says, interesting series of wonders and amazes for the reader. In my sated reader mode, I suspected that Phil, that is Philip Jose Farmer, was conscientiously running through all the dangers inherent on the planet and moon and then wrapped it up nicely with a happy ending. Struck me as rather mechanical, but what the hell, I enjoyed it, but didn't believe it for a minute. That's an interesting set of observations. Finally, we get to uh, More Than Fire. And there's a lot of different reviews of this. By the way, all these reviews are coming directly from the Philip Jose Farmer website. So, you know, they're, they're not candy coating what other people had to say about it. So here's, here's a, a 1993 review. This seems intended to be the conclusion of Farmer's World of Tears series. It resembles somewhat one of his famous River World tales in that it is essentially a playground for Farmer's exceedingly fertile imagination. The thread of plot that runs throughout World of Tears is the contention between the Earthborn hero Kikaka and Lord Red Orc, deadliest inhabitant of pocket universes that make up the Tears and also champion of the arrogant and decadent Lords. In More Than Fire, the rivalry reaches a climax of fast action and ingenious touches in world building. The fact that farmers' notions of sexy are what were considered taboo-breaking a generation ago may affect the reception of this book, or not. Farmer's large established readership will not be disappointed. So that's, that's a rather positive review. 
Here's, here's another one. Hugo Award farmer, Hugo Award winner farmer Red Orcs Rage returns to his popular World of Tears for a disappointing conclusion. Tears is in a continuum of often very different pocket universes created by the super powerful lords. Skipping down a little bit. Um, for the most part, Kikaka and his lover Anana wander aimlessly from universe to universe until they're captured by Red Orc, who, in the manner of foolish villains everywhere, toys with them long enough for Kikaka to escape and force a final climactic conf confrontation. The World of Tears novels were always mainly action and adventure, nothing deep, but here Farmer fails to deliver even that. The action is flat. The plot hopelessly contrived. The characters less engaging than in previous outings, and the new worlds less vivid. And the prose is often worse than even pulp adventure ought to be. Even diehard fans of the series will likely be disappointed. So, yeah, that's, you know, kind of a, a tough one right there. Um... Another review points out that uh, More Than Fire reads as if the author had started writing the next adventure of Kikaka right after completing the Lavalite world, but had decided to add to the mix something of his sexy, violent Essex House, house work, right? I'm not quite sure what Essex House is, but it gets mentioned several times in this review. Um, he says... Like the river world, the universes of the lords offer boundless playgrounds for adventuring worlds of endless variety where just about anything humans can remotely be imagined is liable to turn up, even if it's a little crazy, violent, sexy, or off-center. Also like the river world, uh, our understanding of it is subject to endless revisions as previous accounts are revealed to be erroneous or deliberately misleading. It's a world conducive to suspicion or even paranoia where all possible lies, deceits, mistakes, and misinterpretations have to be anticipated and allowed for, and even then, there can be surprises. The World of Tears is probably after the Riverworld Farmer's most popular creation, and appropriately so, since I suspect it is close to his own heart. Interesting one there, right? I'll just read one more. Um, this is kind of a funny one. The cover promises shirtless macho men, guns, martial arts, exotic worlds, love, peril, and elaborate computer at the very least. What readers get is the very least. For 250 pages, our man Kikaka the trickster travels through gates into other worlds, either running from or towards his archenemy Red Orc. Kikaka's tricky escapes are usually achieved by some Thoan lords rigging the gates to drop him where the lords darn well pleased to annoy one another. After Kikaka's been manipulated by this lord and that, he finally battles the Red Orc in the hand-to-hand -hand combat, pro combat promised on the cover. The fight is what the readers expected all along if they've lasted this long. Testicle grabbing, eyeball crushing, blood spouting action. But Kikaka and Red Orc both live. For hundreds of pages and hundreds, maybe thousands of years, these enemies vowed to murder each other, and in the end they settle for a lobotomy for the loser. More Than Fire is supposed to be the climactic final chapter to Farmer's World of Tears series. Followers of the series must ignore the inconsistent language and focus on the action which must have occurred in the earlier novels. There's no fire here as well. Damning uh, uh, criticism, isn't that? Now, what can we say about all this? Maybe some of it has to do with critics needing to score points at the time. Um, are the If you only went by the, these reviews, you would say, well, I don't know that I really want to read these. Having read them myself as, you know... Uh, I guess, not a, quite a young man, just a teenager. And then having read them again um, recently, several times, I would say that these critics are actually quite mistaken about, the, about several points. I mean, all of them do acknowledge that there's a lot of action going on. The question is, does the action make any sense? <laughs> or, or is it just Farmer writing essentially piss... Uh, picaresque novels in which Kikaka, you know, engages perhaps in some wish fulfillment on Farmer's part, if we want to get all, you know, Freudian uh, critique about this. Or is there is there a coherent plot going on within these novels? Are there 
grand themes that are being explored, um, do these actually have any depth to them? Are they worth checking out? Or are they something that we can say, well, they had their day, but you know, River World, that's great. Um, day World, pretty good too. This we'll, we'll leave behind. I would say that's, that's, that's a wrong view of it. Now, they are fun, fast-paced stories. Um, there are a lot of cool ideas being brought up. The, the issue of paranoia that one of the uh, reviewers brought up is indeed a real concern within these works. So I'm, I'm going to hit on that as one of the philosophical themes, tying it in with the, the question of the lords. So that's well worth examining and working through. Um, I will say that I think that many of the reviews are, you know, off and um, missing. The, the reviewer must have missed something in these. But you'll have to decide as you yourself read through these. Let's talk now about the worlds, the pocket universes, and how people are getting from one to the, the other and why they're doing that. So we're going to have a bit of the plot, a bit of discussion of characters, a bit of sort of review, but we'll be focusing on the world building that is continuing in these very interesting works. These Worlds of Speculative Fiction series sessions would be nothing without talking about world building. We've already done this a bit in the previous section, looking at the first three novels. So some of what we're going to be doing here, you might say, is a little bit of review and then addition, right? Because Farmer in his universes, his narrative universe, is adding in new pocket universes, new worlds that the Lords have created, he's also doing something kind of extraordinary in the fourth book. And we'll get to that in just a moment. Before that, though, I do want to take on something that, that certain critics have levied against Philip Jose Farmer. And, and they did this in a way not just to classify, but also to, in a certain way, we might say, put down uh, this, this series. And indeed, farmers' works in general. This would also apply to the River World series. So this is billed as science fiction, but some people say it's not really science fiction at all. It's really science fantasy. And what is science fantasy? It's kind of a hybrid where there isn't much science involved in it, whether hard science, you know, physics, chemistry, all the, the things that go into space flight or any of those sorts of matters. In this case, we don't need them because we have gates, right? Or even the uh, sociological or soft or human sciences, right? And I would say that this is not entirely correct. Um, there is a lot of technology in this that nobody actually knows how to use. A uh, farmer, I suppose, gets around that problem by saying the lords themselves had scientists, but the current lords have no idea what they're doing with these devices uh, in, in the sense of like understanding their guts, understanding them in and out. But they are actually <clears throat> using the very powerful devices. And Red Orc perhaps does, in fact, understand those things because he was a scientist. In any case, I think it is fair to say that this is science fantasy. I don't see that as making these books less good, you know, uh, in, in any important respect. They're still telling excellent stories. They're still engaging in interesting speculation. So putting that aside for the moment, although I, I, I should mention one really central aspect of this that is science fantasy rather than science fiction, is the use of the gates, right? Not only do we have these pocket universes, but you move from one pocket universe to the other by means of these um, rarely present in the universes, but present all the time in the stories uh, sorts of, of mechanisms. And there are a number of different worlds. So what is Philip Jose Farmer adding to the story here? 
The Lavalite world, which is created by Orthona, is this world which is constantly in flux. The world itself is the landscape changes over time. You can't count on anything. It's stocked with all sorts of horrible creatures that Orthona made in his, his bio labs, like you know, carnivorous trees that roam the wilderness by the thousands, uh, you know, all sorts of other interesting animals that could kill you. And then there's human beings that he brought from elsewhere. And these human beings exist in a kind of miserable condition. They, they don't have fire, so they have to eat all their meat raw. Um, they routinely raid other tribes to try to steal their children because life, uh, although, you know, lifespans can be very long, Odds are they're not going to be, and in order for tribes to survive, you need to constantly induct and adopt uh, other human beings. So the other thing that's really kind of interesting about this Lavalite world is that every once in a while, a chunk of it breaks off and becomes a satellite, and you know, like a moon, and, and, and starts circling it, and then eventually comes back to it and connects up with it. This is why it's the Lavalite world. Lavalite is another word for a lava, a lava lamp, right? If you've ever seen those things, goop, you know, goop kind of floats around in it. They're popular among uh, hippies and, and uh, college students for their rooms. So the world itself breaks off these chunks every so often. And when they recombine, it's like a cataclysm. So dangerous place to be. There's all sorts of other features of it that I won't go into. Um, there's a number of, of worlds that you're, they're jumping around uh, from one to the next in more than fire, including one world, very interesting idea, that is essentially a giant supercomputer. It's been hollowed out from the inside, and the, the computer has the um, memory, the codes for this incredibly devastating weapon, device that Red Orc is after. It's also monitored and um, tended to by um, this, uh, this, this creature, this robot, and so there's some interesting action taking place there. There's other dimensions as well that are explored. For example, the world of the good lord or good goddess, uh, Manathu Vorkian, um, and a number of other places as well. I think that one of the highlights of this, though, is found in the fourth book. Because in that book, behind the walls of Terra, so what are the walls of Terra? They are the dimensions within which we exist, right? We human beings, Earth and its solar system. We think that that's, you know, the universe. As it turns out, Earth is only one of the pocket universes that were created by the Lords, <clears throat> a theme that we'll explore shortly in much greater detail looking at the sections of the book. But what's really interesting about the world building is that as opposed to all the other worlds, you know, the world of tears itself, Jadawin's world, which they spend some time in, in um, more than fire as well, um, as opposed to all these other imaginative universes, some of which are kind of, you know, trap or terrible worlds like uh, the lava light world, right? The changing world. Uh, Earth is our Earth. And Philip Jose Farmer, for the first time, is no longer engaging in fantasy about what would it be like for somebody from Earth to go into this other world, like the world of tears or um, the lava light world. And instead, he is saying, what would it be like if somebody who has been away from this world, Earth, for 30-odd years returns to it in 1970? And the answer is, well, at least the portion of it that he's focusing on, uh, California, specifically Los Angeles, it's not a very good world compared to these other worlds. In this world, Earth, um, you know, human beings are, are 
overrunning the planet. They're creating smog. They're living a, a life that's, you know, not as good as, as those in other places, perhaps, unless you happen to belong to the elites. Uh, the food even doesn't taste that good for the most part. There's all sorts of crazy things going on. There's biker gangs. There's, you know, hippie bands. There's, uh, you know, mobsters. And that is where a lot of the action is taking place in behind the walls of Terra. We, we also do get to see, um, you know, some, some other interesting settings coming up in that, in, including going to the world that the lords themselves uh, created. Well, the, the lords themselves originated from, rather. Um, and so there's all these different universes. One thing that we can say to sum up is that Philip Jose Farmer's narrative universe is actually a multiverse of interconnected pocket universes which include earth and include all these other places that you can get to via these gates and it's kind of an open-ended place where you could probably set additional stories although he did you know say uh, with more than fire i'm done with this and as far as i know other than maybe some fan fiction nobody has added to the narrative universe of the world of tears so that is the setting that he is developing for us it's you know a pretty multifaceted one we're moving from place to place to place and we're doing so in a way that um, doesn't require extensive travel, like you know, travel among the stars or anything like that. Instead, we have this, this process of instantaneous gating. One of the first philosophical themes that we should discuss is a cosmological one that has to do with the nature of the universe, or in this case, universes all within a single narrative universe. So you notice we're using the word universe there in a rather ambiguous or polysemic way. It means more than one thing. There are pocket universes within the vast narrative universe, which is supposed to depict an existing universe. But as we're going to find, there's an incredible revelation that is taking place within the first, well, the first 60, 70 pages of uh, Beyond the Walls of Terra. And then it's going to get expanded over the course of that book and also the later books. So we start with a discussion, a short discussion between Anana and Kikaka. And Anana says, um, here we go. Uh, uh, Kikaka says, you barely got started telling me the story of your uncle. And she's talking about, you know, Red Orc and uh, Vala, who's also died in an earlier book. They don't, they don't quite know that. And um, she says, Red Orc escaped, however, and came back to this universe which was the first one he made after leaving the home world. And Kikaka, who has grown up in this universe, Earth, right, says, w w wait a second. He says, what? And his, his hand flailing out, knocked over his glass of beer. He paid no attention but stared at her. What did you say? She says, you, do, do you want me to repeat the whole thing? No, no, that final, the part where you said he came back to this universe, the first one he made. And uh, Anana says, yes, what's so upsetting about that? Kikaka did not stutter often, but now he could, quite, he could not quite get the words out. Finally, he said, L listen, I accept the idea of the pocket universes of the Lords because I've lived in one half my life. And I know others because I've been told about them by a man who doesn't lie. And I've seen the Lords of other universes, including you. And I know there are at least 1,008 of these relatively small manufactured universes, but I'd always thought, I still think, it's impossible my, you, my universe is a natural one, just as you say your home universe uh, it, it was. And she says, well, I didn't say that. She took his hand and squeezed it. Dear Kikaka, does it upset you so much? You must be mistaken, Anna. 
he said. Do you have any idea of the vastness of this universe? In fact, it's infinite. No man could make this incredibly complex and gigantic world. My God, the nearest star is four and some light years away, and the most distant is billions of light years away, and there must be others billions of billions of light years beyond these. And then there's the age of this universe, why this planet alone is two and one half billion years old, the last I heard. That's a hell of a lot older than 15,000 years when the lords moved out of their home world to make their pocket universes. A hell of a lot older. Anana smiled and patted his head as if she were his grandmother and he a very small child. There, there. No reason to get upset, lover. I wonder why Wolf didn't tell you. Probably he forgot it when he lost his memory. And when he got his memory back, he didn't get all of it back. Or perhaps he took it for so granted that he never considered you didn't know, just as I took it for granted. How then can you explain the infinite size of the world and the age of Earth and the evolution of life, he said triumphantly. There, how do you explain evolution, the undeniable record of the fossils, carbon-14 dating, potassium-argon dating? I read about these new discoveries in a magazine on the bus, and their evidence is scientifically irrefutable. Right? And that's, that's where it leaves off for the time being. Now notice what, what's happening in this passage that farmer has going on between these two lovers. One of them, a Thoan, a lord who has lived thousands of years. The other, Kikaka, the trickster, who has lived, as he points out, half his life in the pocket universe, that is the world of tears, or Jodowin's world. What is going on here? It's a revelation of the fact that our, not only our world, Earth, but also our universe, is in some respects, now here we have to be a little careful. Is it a simulacrum, which is a word that will get used later on in more than fire? Is it a simulation? Is it a fake? No, but it is a manufactured pocket universe. It is not the creation of God, although the Thoans or Lords would like to pretend that they're gods. It's not the product of simple, you know, astronomic physics and all of these other, you know, interesting things coming together. The animals are not simply the product of evolution. Human beings, as it's going to turn out, are not simply the product of evolution either, but in a certain way are modeled after, are made in the image of the Lords. So this is a lot to take in especially if you're not used to that. And notice that Kikaka is not getting this just as a raw beginner. You know, he knows that there are all these pocket universes, but he wants to think that Earth is in some way special. And Anana has to explain this to him. A little bit later, they take up the conversation again. So uh, here we go. While they walked, Kikaka questioned her about Red Orc and the alleged, <laughs> he's saying, and that's in quotes there, creation of Earth. So this is what Anana tells him. There was the universe of the Lords in the beginning, and that was the only one we knew about. Then after 10,000 years of civilization, my ancestors formulated the theory of artificial universes. Once the, con the mathematics of the concept was realized, it was only a matter of time and will until the first pocket universe was made. Then the same space would hold two worlds of space matter, but one would be impervious to the inhabitants of the other because each universe was at right angles to the other. You realize the term right angles doesn't mean anything. It's just an attempt to explain something that can only really be explained to one who understands the mathematics of the concept. I myself, though I designed a universe of my own and then built it, never understood the mathematics of even how the world-making machines operated. So, you know, this is the story of the lords who, they have this amazing technology. Most of them, uh, the scientist class, were actually wiped out by the Black Bellers. So very few of them actually understand how to make this uh, the, 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 the why, the causality, uh, but they understand, you know, how to make the pocket universes. So she says, the first artificial universe was constructed about 200 years before I was born. It was made by a group of lords. They didn't call themselves lords then, by the way, among whom were my father, Urizen, and his brother, Orc. Orc had already lived the equivalent of 2,000 terrestrial years. He'd been a physicist, then a biologist, and finally a social scientist. 
The initial step is like blowing a balloon in non-space. Can you conceive it? I can't either, but that's the way it was explained to me. You blow a balloon in non-space, that is, you create a small space or a small universe, one into which you can gate your machines, then expand the space next to or in the time space of the original universe. The new world is expanded, so you can gate even larger machines into it, and these expand the universe more, and you gate more machines into the larger space. From the beginning of this making of a new world, you have set up a world which may have quite different physical laws than the original universe. It's a matter of shaping the space-time matter, so that's a gravity works different than in the, the original world. However, the first new universe was crude, you might say. It embodied no new principles. It was, in fact, an exact imitation of the original. Well, not in the sense that it was not a copy of the world as it was, but as it had been in our past. Here's the kicker now. The copy was this, my world, Kikaka said, Earth's? She nodded and said, it, this universe was the first. And it was made approximately 15,000 Earth years ago. The solar system deviated only in small particulars from the solar system of the Lords. This Earth deviated only slightly from the native planet of the Lords. You mean? He was silent when they walked half a block, and then he said, so... That explains what they meant when you said this world was fairly recent. I know that that could not be so, because potassium argon and xenon argon dating prove irrefutably that the world is more than two and a half billion years old. Hominid fossils have been found that are at least 1,750,000 years old. And then we have carbon-14. And, and then he goes on and says, but you're saying that the rocks of your world, which were four and a half billion years old, were reproduced in our universe. So they were really only made 15,000 years ago. They would seem to be four and a half billion years old. And we find fossils that prove that dinosaurs lived 60 million years ago. And we find stone tools and skeletons of men who lived a million years ago. But these were duplicated from your world. That's exactly right, she says. So this is, we should actually pause here for a moment. This overcomes a very interesting problem, doesn't it? All of the things that science tells us about, you know, the, the age and development of our world and, and, you know, the many things within it, just copies from the Thoans world, which is an older world. She goes, he goes on and says, wait a second, what about the stars, the galaxies, the supernovas, the quasars, the millions, billions of them, billions of light years away, the millions of stars in this galaxy alone, which is 100,000 light years across, the redshift of light, he goes on and on and on. And he says, or she says, this universe is the first and the largest of the artificial ones, well, not the largest. The second one was just as large. Its diameter is three times that of the distance from the sun to the planet Pluto. If men ever build a ship to voyage to the nearest star, they will get past the orbit of Pluto and then to a distance twice that of Pluto from the sun. And then, and then the ship will enter an area where it will be destroyed. It will run into a, what shall I call it? A force field is the only term I can think about. And it would disappear in a blaze of energy. So will any other ship. The stars are not for men mainly because there are no stars. Kikaka wanted to protest violently. He felt outraged, but he forced himself to say calmly, how do you explain that? The space matter outside the orbit of Pluto is a simulacrum, a tiny simulacrum, relatively tiny, uh, that, that is. But the effects of light from the stars, the nebulas and so forth, the redshift, the speed of light, all that, there's a warping factor that gives all the necessary illusions. All extra Plutonian astronomy, all cosmology was false. So again, this is, this is a real kick in the pants for, for Kikaka. And it would be for any uh, terrestrial human, would it not? He's finding out that it's not that the whole world is a simulacrum, but it's, you might say, bounded by a simulacrum that gives us the impression of this incredibly consistent, complicated universe that doesn't exist at all. 
but the world exists. It's not a simulation. That, that's the natural thing for people to bring up. Oh, this, is, this means that Jose, Philip Jose Farmer is working with simulation theory. And we should think about what that means. When we say that, that we're living in a simulation the way that some people want to, you know, a la The Matrix or The 13th Floor or any of these other you know, movies of that sort, what we're saying is that there's a basis, which is the real basis, and then there's the illusion that we have and the illusion is of what we're experiencing here and that illusion is generated on this basis it could be computers could be you know Rene Descartes and an evil demon could be whatever you want right it could be any sort of thing but what we're seeing is not real that's not the case in these pocket universes the pocket universes are real they just happen to be manufactured or created, or in the case of Earth, the imitation, the perfect imitation of a past world. Now there's more to the story. There's actually two more twists that we, we have to go. So Kikaka says, why do the Lords feel it necessary to set up this simulacrum of an infinite ever expanding universe with its trillions of heavenly bodies? Why didn't they just leave the sky blank except for the moon and the planets? Why this utterly cruel deception? Or need I ask, I had forgotten the, that the moment that the lords are cruel. She patted his hand, looking up into his eyes and said, The lords are not the only cruel ones. You forget that I told you this universe was an exact copy of ours. I mean exact. From the center, that is the sun, to the outer walls of this universe, your world is a duplicate of ours. That includes the simulacrum of extrasolar space. He stopped and said, you mean the native world of the Lords was an artificial universe too? Yes, after three ships had been sent out past our outermost planet to the nearest star, uh, only 4.3 light years away, as we thought, a fourth ship was sent. But this had disappeared in a burst of light. It was not destroyed, but could progress no further than the first three. It was repelled by a force field, or was turned away by the structure of the space-matter continuum at that point. At, for, after some study, we reluctantly came to the realization there were no stars or outer space, not as we had thought of them. The revelation was not accepted by many people. In, in fact, the impact of this discovery was so great that our civilization was in a near-psychotic state for some time. Some historians have maintained it was the discovery that we were in an artificial, comparatively finite universe that spurred us, stung us into searching for the means of making our own synthetic universes. Because if we were ourselves the product of a people who made our universe and therefore made us, then we too could make our worlds. So Kikaka says, then Earth's world is not even second hand, it's third hand. But who could have made your world? Who are the Lord's? Of the Lords. So this is another big revelation about the culture of these Thoans, these not not quite aliens, but actually in some respect, much closer to us than any alien could be. It's very imaginative work here. So who are these Lords of the Lords? Who are these others? Um, so there is a, a number of discussions about this, and one of these does take place in uh, behind the walls of of Terra, right? Um, the, there's this discussion of the the world of the lords, the, the one that was itself a, a creation, but then later on there is um, some discussion of a creature who's found. Here we go. So they, they, through gating in, they find themselves in this room with a perhaps corpse or perhaps one in suspended animation. And um, it's a sort of lizard-like man. And Anana says, My people had stories about a sapient but non-human species who preceded us Thoan. They were said to have created us. Whether the tales were originally part of the prehistoric Thoan cultures or were early fiction, we don't really know. But most Thoan insist that we originated naturally. We were not made by anybody. My ancestors did make your kind. These are the multitude of life forms were made in my ancestors' biofactories to populate their artificial pocket universes. 
but that we Thoan could be artificial beings never. However, the stories did describe the Thokina as somewhat like that creature there, but the Thokina were a different species from us. We were supposed to have invaded their universe and killed all but one. I don't know. There are conflicting legends about them. Um, one of the early tales was that the, there was the one Thokina who survived the, the war and hid somewhere. He placed himself in an impenetrable tomb. Then he went into a deep sleep from which he will not be awakened until the worlds are in danger of destruction. And so there, that's one uh, bit of the story. Um, a little bit later on, we get an expansion of it. Uh, here we go. So this is when um, we've been introduced to a, a lord who's not a bad guy, uh, is actually quite a good woman who rules over her own pocket dimension, uh, Mathanu Vorkian. And she tells him um, a, a, a bit of the, the backstory as well. Um, she finds out that, that you know, he is seeing the Thokina and she says, it can't be. And, and Kikaka says, why not? She swung around to face him because they're only creatures of folklore and legend born of primitive fears and imagination. When I was a child, my parents and the house slaves told me stories about them. In some of these, the Thokina were a non-human species who were the predecessors of the Thoan, the lords. In other tales, they made the first Thoan and enslaved them. Then the Thoan revolted and killed all but one. That sole survivor fled to some unknown universe, according to the story, and put himself into a sort of suspended animation. But the tale, which was a very spooky one for a child, told how he would rise one day when the time was ripe and would join the greatest enemy of the Thoan and help him slay all of them. That greatest enemy would be a Leblabi, that is a human being, possibly Kikaka, right? And um, she goes on and he says, the tale also described how he would then kill the last Thoan and become the lord of all the worlds. Another story said that he would join the Lebabi and help them overthrow the lords. The tales made enjoyable hair-raising stories for the children, but the Thokina could actually be that. He says, I'm not lying. And I was wondering about the image of the scaly man I saw in a goblet during the feast. And so that is uh, more of the backstory. And then we get a little bit more a bit later. It's never fully sketched out, right? Here, the Thokina uh, Karuz has been um, resuscitated and is talking with Kikaka. Karuz had told Kikaka that parts of the outline of the legends about the Kringdes the, their own word for the Thokina, were close to the truth. But the details were usually wrong. When the Thoan people had killed off all the Kringdes except for him, he'd made an underground retreat. After being there for a while, <clears throat> he'd stopped the molecular motion of his body and settled down for a long sleep. Um, and what, what he's doing is he's, he's saying, um, I'm going to sleep until this machine wakes me up. By then... The probabilities that the situation would be considerably changed were high. The lords might have died out. Their numbers were comparatively few at the time I went into stasis, and their descendants, if these existed, might be different in culture and temperament. They might be more tolerant and empathetic, or some other sentient species higher on an ethical level than the lords might have replaced the Thoan. In any event, whoever inhabited the universes might be willing to accept me, if not, then I would have to deal with the evil as best as I could. Backing up a little bit, he, he also tells that um, his people had been called the Kringdes, um, and uh, that you know they they were indeed the the creators. So what we've got here is a really interesting, rich, deep backstory that's being revealed, sort of like the peeling of an onion where human beings created by the lords, manipulated by the lords, their very earth is a creation, a pocket universe, but the lords themselves, the Thoans, are not the masters of reality. They themselves are products. This can be, you know, very devastating psychologically. It can also be liberating in certain ways as well to learn that we're not, you know, these originary beings 
but that we're also manufactured doesn't necessarily have to be such a kick in the pants. We could think about the creation stories, and I'll, I'll just mention two in very quick passing. I will also point out that one of the things that Hari Frankfurt, the philosopher um, who's you know said so much about so many different topics, points out about the Genesis book of you know Genesis account that's so normative for for Jews and Christians, is that human beings are indeed the very first artifacts. As opposed to everything else which is spoken into creation, God in that story takes something, clay, and breathes spirit into it and then creates um, human beings as an artifact. So we are the, the tool, if you like, or the creation that is not direct, um, also mentioned in the Babylonian Enuma Elish, which in some respects bears closer similarity to what the lords are like here. Human beings are created to be the slaves for the gods so that the gods don't have to be slaves for each other. And they're created out of dirt and the blood of a captured, conquered, and subjugated god so that they can indeed serve the, the deities. So that's probably enough about that theme. Another key philosophical theme that we ought to discuss is this character Kikaka, the trickster, right? The uh, person who has left our universe as a fairly young man, spent a lot of time in the world of tears, made it his own, uh, the lover of Anana the Bright, uh, all sorts of other important things, and perhaps the the subject of a prophecy about the lablabi, the human being who will destroy the, the realm, the, the rule of the, the lords. Now that prophecy gets mentioned, doesn't play a big role, but Kikaka's ancestry is sort of an object of speculation. So this is when um, Kikaka is is talking with Red Orc, and Red Orc says, um, you make yourself sound very tricky and resourceful, so tricky I could almost think you were a lord, not just a lablabi earthling. And then Kikaka says, Anana has the crazy idea I could be the son of a lord. In fact, she thinks I could be your son. Orc said, what? And then he began laughing, and he said, that felt good. I haven't laughed like that for how long? Never mind, so you really think you could be my child? Not me, Kikaka said. Anana, she likes to speculate it because she needs some justification for falling in love with a leblabi. If I could be half lord, then I'd be more acceptable. But this idea is 100% wishful thinking, of course. Red Orc says, I have no children because I want to interfere as little as possible with the natural development here, but you could be the child of another lord, I suppose. However, you've got me off the subject. And then, then it goes on... Um, Again, and this this gets taken up a little bit later in the same book. Um, here we go. So Red Orc is talking, and he's introduced himself to Kikaka, uh, and he says, The trap may be so subtle that I was led into thinking I said it, and then perhaps I did. What does it matter? We're all led here for one reason or another to the final bat battleground. It has been a good battle because we're not fighting through our underlings, the Leblabi. We're fighting directly as we should. You are the only earthling in this battle, and I'm convinced that you may be half lord. So Red Orc now has come around to this idea. And he says, um, you know, you, you have some family resemblances to us. I could be your father or Athona or Uriel or even that dark one, Jadawin. Uh, and it's possible that Anana could be your mother, too, in which case you might be all lord. That would explain your amazing abilities and your successes. Um, Kikaka says, I don't know what you're getting at, Orc, but Anana couldn't possibly be my mother. Anyway, I know who my parents are. They were Indiana farmers who came from old American stock, including the oldest and from Scotch, Norwegian, German, and Irish immigrants. I was born in the very small rural village of North Terre Haute, and there is no mystery. He stopped because there had been a mystery. <laughs> His parents had moved from Kentucky to Indiana, and suddenly he remembered the mysterious Uncle Robert who had visited their farm from time to time when he was very young. 
And there was the trouble with his birth certificate when he had volunteered for the Army Cavalry. And when he had returned from to Indiana after the war, he'd been left $10,000 from an unknown benefactor. It was to put him through college. And then there'd been the vague promise of more to come. There is no mystery, Red Orc said. I know far more about you than you would dream possible. When I found out that your natal name was Paul Giannis Finnegan, I remembered something and I checked it out. Now, that, and then things start uh, kicking off again, and, and that's that. Uh, we do get a longer um, discussion of Kikaka's background and ancestry coming up uh, in, here we go, the very end of, of that book. Oh, no, actually, in the Lava Light world. Um, And it, 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 this is very interesting. It comes up in relation to a discussion about a kind of loneliness and wanting to belong on the part of Kikaka after he's been adopted by this, this particular tribe. So he says um, much of his life he'd been a loner. <clears throat> he was neither asocial nor antisocial. He, he'd had no trouble mixing with his playmates. Um, because of his intense curiosity, athletic abilities, and linguistic ability, he'd been both popular and a reader, a leader, but he was a voracious reader, and quite often when he had a choice between recreation with others or reading, he decided on the latter. His time was limited because a farmer's son was kept very busy. He also studied hard to get good grades in school. He knew he didn't want to be a farmer. He wanted to go to uh, faraway places, but that required a PhD, and to get that, he'd have to get high grades through high school and college. So he read everything he could get his hands on. Um, and then <clears throat> a little bit later, an outsider observing him from the age of 17 through 22 would not have known he was often with his peers, but not of them. They would have seen a star athlete and superior student who palled around with the roughest, raced around the country at roads on a motorcycle, tumbled many girls in the hay, literally got disgustingly drunk, and once was jailed for running a police roadblock. His parents had been mortified, his mother weeping, his father raging. And so it goes on and on and on, and he gets in trouble. He gets put on probation by the judge, and he stays on the farm. And then here, here's another key point. And then <clears throat> Mr. and Mrs. Finnegan, perhaps in an effort to straighten him out even more, perhaps in an unconscious desire to hurt him as he'd hurt them, revealed something that shocked him. He was an adopted child. Paul was stunned. Like most children, he'd gone through a phase when he believed he was adopted, but he had not kept to the fantasy which children conceive during periods when they think their parents don't love them. But it was true, and he didn't want to... Believe it. According to his step-parents, his real mother was an Englishwoman with the quaint name of Philly Jane Fogg Fogg. Under other circumstances, he would have thought this hilarious. Not now. And I'm, I'm going to skip over the long genealogical thing going on here. Um, so, in any case, the revelation had shaken Paul terribly. It was after this that he began to suffer from a sense of loneliness, or perhaps a sense of being abandoned. Once he'd learned all the details he wanted to know about his true parents, he never spoke of them again. When he mentioned his parents to others, he spoke only of the man and woman who'd reared him. Two years after Kikaka learned about his true parents, Mr. Finnegan fell ill with cancer and died in six months. This was grief enough, but three months after the burial, his mother had also fallen victim to the same disease. Um, <clears throat> so Kikaka stays there and you know, works on the farm, uh, takes a, 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 a part-time job as a mechanic, um, pals around with some of his friends. Five years went by swiftly. Suddenly he was 23. The farm still wasn't paid off. He couldn't see himself as a farmer for the rest of his life. So he sold the farm at a very small profit. Now it was evident that his hopes of entering college and becoming an anthropologist would have to, would have to be set aside. The United States would be getting into the war in a year or two. So he enlists in the cavalry, winds up in a tank, winds up over in, in Europe under Patton, uh, and on a brief leave, you know, during a lull in the fighting, finds himself in a small museum in a German town that he helped clear out. He found a curious object, a crescent of some silvery metal. He discharged from the army and returned to Terre Haute, where he didn't plan to stay long. 
and he gets a uh, check for ten thousand dollars from his uh, his uh, father. And he says, "My father, he didn't have a pot to pee, and you know that. Not the man who adopted you. It's from your real father. Where is he? I'll kill him." You wouldn't want to go where he is. He's six feet under, buried in a church cemetery in Oregon. He got religion years ago and became a fire-eating, brimstone-drinking, hallelujah-shouting uh, revivalist. But the old bastard must have had some conscious left. He willed all his estate to you. So Paul goes off, Paul Kikaka, uh, to the uh, University of Indiana and begins um, studies. And then the adventure begins. There's a, a story in the newspaper about this silvery crescent that he found, and this man Vanix comes to try to buy it from him. And long story short, we find this out in the earlier uh, story, he winds up, Paul winds up being transported to the world of tears, Yadawin's world, and lives there for, for a long time. And then there's more backstory about the Bellers and all of that, because it's, it's revelation for the Lavalite world, this novel, that, this fifth novel that's being written later. Now, what do we want to focus on there? So there's a couple different themes kicking around. One is this notion that Kikaka himself is an extraordinary individual, mentally, physically, morally, and so perhaps he's one of the Lord's uh, children, a demi-lord, so to speak, or perhaps he's just the best of what humanity has to offer. Farmer likes to work with what we nowadays would call superheroes or you know, extraordinary individuals. You see this running throughout all of his, his works. Um, and so that's one theme. But this theme of adoption is particularly interesting and important, and the theme of loneliness and forging relationships. He doesn't let a lot of people in easily. When he does, it's, it's a major bond. His relationship with Yadawin or Wolf and Chrysace, Wolf's consort, is one. His relationship with Anana is another one. Very interesting because he's offered the chance to mate with, you know, to engage in Congress with effectively a goddess who has her own entire pocket universe and looks like one of the lords who's not a baddie and says, no, I'm faithful to Anana. And so, you know, there's, there's all of this going on. He forms and forges a relationship with her. He's adopted by many different peoples and within the scope of that finds himself feeling a sense of responsibility for each of them and i think this is an important part of this character who really is along with anana the main character of these last three novels of the world of tears the relationship between the narrative that philip jose farmer is spinning out for us here in these three interesting wrap up actually like build out novels that comprise volume two of the world of tears and other narratives whether they be science fiction and fantasy or pulp stuff or whether they be the writings of blake turn out to be an important interesting theme here in this work. I, I will mention that not only in these books, but also in some of the earlier books, there is an interesting discussion, an uh, interesting reference, let's say, where, you know, um, Kikaka will say something like, this isn't a science fiction story, you know, things don't happen that way, right? And of course, this is a science fiction story. So it's, it's an interesting way of uh, breaking the fourth wall, so to speak, and, you know, trying to introduce verisimilitude. But there's a longer passage where this guy Clifton in More Than Fire, who's glimpsed first in the lava light world, right, in, in uh, the palace uh, that's, that's wandering away from them. This guy Clifton is brought up and he's dressed kind of weird. He talks kind of weird. And it turns out that he's met Blake, right? William Blake. So um, here we go. Uh, Kikaka um, says, does this have anything to do, this, this story that you're telling with the, main, with the main story? And then Clifton says, very much so. I cannot leave it out. Do you know Blake's poetry? 
uh, Kikaka says, I read some of his poems when I was in high school. Blake had been born, if he remembered correctly, in, 15, in 1757 and had died in 1827. He was an eccentric who is Christian, but his ideas about religion differed much from the views of his time or from any other views than in, in Kikaka's time. This much he had learned from his English teacher. Clifton said, did you know that Blake wrote, Blake wrote poetic works in which he made up his own mythology? No, he mixed them with Christian elements. So his didactic and symbolical works were apocalyptic poems in which the characters were gods and goddesses he invented or said he invented. He conceived his own mythology and the deities in them had names such as Los, Antharmon, Red Orc, Vala, and Ahania. What? You, you must be. So you're not kidding, Kikaka said. He turned to Anana. Did you know this? Her eyes widened. Yes, I did, but don't get angry with me. The subject just didn't come up, though I've met Blake. You've met Blake? Kikaka was so fat, flabbergasted that he spluttered, yet he knew she must be telling the truth. This Blake matter had meant little to her, and she would have recalled it if he'd mentioned the poet's name. So he asked Clifton, w what happened? Here's what Clifton says. Mr. Blake was a mystic visionary and exceedingly eccentric. His eyes were the wildest, the brightest, and the piercingest I've ever seen. His face was like an elf, one of the dangerous elves. And as it goes on, right, there's more and more discussion here about this ring that takes place. And then finally, Anana says... Um, they're talking about these visitations, the figures of beings and things from the su supernatural. Though sometimes he spoke of them as visitors from other worlds. Anana said, sometimes he called them emanations from the unknown worlds. And Kikaka said, from whom did you hear this? I heard it directly from Blake. As you know, after Red Orc made the universe of Earth and the universe of Earth's twin, he forbade any lords to visit them, but some did go there, and I was one of them. I've told you that I've been on Earth one several times, and though I didn't mention all the times and places I've been there, when I was living in London, a fascinating though disgusting place, I was disguised as a wealthy French noblewoman. Since I collected some of the best of the primitive art of Earthmen, I went to see Blake. I purchased some engravings and uh, temperous sketches from him, but asked him not to tell anyone I'd done so. There didn't seem the slightest chance that Red Orc would hear about it, but I wasn't taking any risks. So it goes on a little bit further, and uh, Anana says, We Thoan who know about Blake have wondered about that, about the Thoan worlds. Our theory is that Blake was a mystic who somehow tuned in, you might say, to a knowledge of the people inhabiting the other universes. He had a sensitivity, perhaps neural, perhaps from a seventh sense we know nothing about. No other Earth person has ever had it. At least we haven't heard of his like. Although there is a theory that some Earth mystics and perhaps some insane Earth people, we just don't know. But somehow Blake received something. What should I call them? Visions, intimations of the artificial pocket universes, perhaps of the original Thoan universe or of that universe that some say preceded the Thoans. In any event... It couldn't have been coincidence that he knew the exact names of many lords and some of the situations and events in which they played their parts. But his uh, psychic receptions of them were distorted and fragmentary, and he used them as part of his personal mythology and mingled Christian mythology with them. The mixture was Blakean, highly imaginative and shaped by his own beliefs. Blake was a freak, though of a high order. And this is very interesting as a technique, because what it allows Farmer to do is to explain how what he's doing has all these characters who are semi-Blakean, but that he's doing his own thing with it. The narrative that Farmer is having Anana give is the real narrative, and Blake, the mystic, visionary, artist, poet from the past, turns out to have distorted forms of that. Very clever to do that, isn't it? So that's a, a, you know, a philosophical theme that we should mention, but I don't think we have to say much more about that. There are a lot of other cool philosophical themes that we could touch on and explore much more, but I'm going to have to put them to the side in order to concentrate on one last theme that we brought up in the previous session, but I want to see through a bit more. Before that, in passing, let's just mention there's a world that is itself a computer. That's a very interesting idea, you know, administered by this robot who more or less can be overcome by, you know, the typical tricks of, of uh, figuring out what the robot 
and his programming can't understand. There's also Red Orc as the consummate villain, um, and we'll talk about him just a little bit because we're going to talk about the Lords, but it is worth mentioning that Red Orc himself seems to have been deluded about his own production of Earth and confused himself with another earlier Orc. Um, there's also the cool, you know, twist early on in, in, uh, behind the walls of Terra that Red Orc a- a- isn't actually Lord of the Earth at this time. It's, it's Urthona who's taken his place. Um, the satire of Earth 1970, well worth reading, uh, all of which is happening in behind the walls of Terra. I will just mention that the Lords in general, want their planets kept relatively clean and earth is seen as a dirty dirty place because red orc being the social scientist doesn't impose that on his experimental subjects the human beings what i want to talk about to bring this to a close is the differences in the mentalities of the lords in relation to each other and in relation to the leblabi or human beings. Leblabi is sort of a slur word for human beings. <clears throat> and what we see are, I've mentioned already, Kekaka may be half lord, may, may not be. Um, he's certainly a humane person. We have mention of Jadawin or Wolf who plays almost no role at all, except as somebody mentioned in this, but Jodowin spent time on earth among human beings, was also raised by a human uh, couple, uh, also adopted, right? And so he has developed a perspective that is different from those of the Lords. We saw that in the second book, um, where he's you know castigating his fellow lords there there is one brother that he has who's a decent person as well and then we also have um, this this uh, goddess uh, Manathu Vorkin who has her own universe and has decided to run it for the benefit <coughs> of the Leblabi as sort of a benevolent despot you know she makes everything um, set up in such a way as to minimize conflict. Everybody has enough to eat. It's kind of a a halcyon place to live in. Um, And then we have Anana. And there's some very interesting back and forth discussions in here about how long can this couple actually go on? There's a certain point in um, Behind the Walls of Terra or the Lavalite world uh, or perhaps it, it, it's at the very beginning when they've been wandering together for 15 years in, in More Than Fire, where she says, you know, gods or, uh, you know, lords, couples have been able to stay together for maybe 50 years tops. You know, I love you, but maybe maybe it's it's good if we do have some distance every once in a while. And it's really quite interesting to see the dynamics between them and to see the development that happens. There's that mention, as I, I brought up before, that Kikaka says, you know, I think it, she thinks I'm half Lord because that makes it easier for her to sleep with me and to be in love with me because it's kind of shameful for her. And we see the disgust on the part of the other Lords for this taking a, a, a human being to be not just a, an occasional lover, but to be your lifelong mate, somebody you care about. This comes to a um, peak in the Lavalite world with um, Urthona. And there's, there's two sections that I think are particularly interesting and revela- revelatory of this, right? So um, she's, she's talking with Urthona. And um, he tells her that, you know, what you're doing is is disgusting. Um, here we go. There's a conversation. Um, Anana shook her head. Uncle, I was once like you. That is utterly unworthy of life. But there was something in me that gave me misgivings. Let us call it a residue of compassion, of empathy. Deep under the coldness and cruelty and arrogance was a spark. And that spark fanned into a great fire fanned by a Lablabi called Kikaka. He's not a lord, for he is a man. That's more than you ever were or will ever be. And these brutish, miserable creatures who've captured you and don't know they hold the lord of their crazy world captive, they're more human than you could conceive. That is, they're retarded lords. She's had a, a total, not just change of heart, but change of perspective. 
Urthona stared and said, what in the spinner's name are you talking about? Anana felt like hitting him, but she said, you wouldn't ever understand. Perhaps I, I shouldn't say ever. After all, I came to understand, but that was because I was forced to be among the Lablabi for a long time. And this Lablabi Kikaka, the descendant of an artificial product, corrupted your mind. It's too bad the council is no longer in effect. You'd be condemned and killed within 10 minutes. And then she says, Anana uh, says, don't forget, uncle, that you too may be the descendant of an artificial product of creatures created in a laboratory. Don't forget that uh, what Shambharaman speculated with much evidence to back his statement, that we too, the lords, may have been made in the laboratory of beings who are as high above us as we are above the Lablabi, or should I say as high above them as we are supposed to be. After all, we made the Lablabi in our image, which means that they are neither above nor below us. They are us, but they don't know that and they have to live in worlds that we created, made rather. We are not creators any more than writers of fiction or painters are creators. They make worlds, but they are never able to make more than what they know. They can write or paint worlds based on the elements of the known, put together in a different order in such a way as to make them to seem to be creators. We, the so-called lords, did no more than poets, writers, and painters, and sculptors. We are not we, are, we were not and we are not gods, though we've come to think of ourselves as such. Spare me your lectures, Athona says. I don't care for your attempts to justify your degeneracy. So we have a very important conflict here. This does also touch on the uh, earlier mentioned themes of the creations of universes and the references to other literary forms. Now, a little bit later, where... Um, Anana probably should have killed Urthona, but didn't do so. There is a interesting conflict. So Urthona says, you won't come with us now. Um, and she says, I get no, uh, here we go. Um, at least you won't tell the chief what we're planning to do. I get no special pleasure out of that, she said. The only thing is, how do I explain your French leave? How do I you know, explain all these, these sorts of things? Um, a little bit earlier than that, you know, he says, why, uh, you know, we, we should get away now. And she says, why would I want to go with you? You surely don't want to spend the rest of your life here. And she says, I don't intend to, but I f mean f to make sure first that Kikaka is either alive or dead. That Liblabi means that much to you? Yes, don't look so disgusted. If you should ever feel that much for another human being, which I doubt, you'll know why I'm making sure about that. And then Urthona um, Gets, gets very angry with her and actually uh, goes to attack her, disgusted by the fact that she loves Kikaka. So a lot of different things at play here. What else can we say about the lords? We, we know that as children, many of them were all right, but then they were corrupted. And what, what corrupted them? There's a lot of mentions of the <clears throat> paranoia of the lords. Why are they paranoid? And this is something that comes up in book after book after book. Their paranoia is so blinding that they can't tell the difference between reality and imagination or, you know, falsehood. Why are they so paranoid? Well, in part because they have all of this power but they also lack knowledge about the powers that they're working with and they're antagonistic towards each other. There's a almost Hobbesian dilemma that goes on where if you can't trust that Lord over there and you know that they can't trust you, you have to strike first so that you can wipe them out. This is what Thomas Hobbes called anticipation or diffidence as opposed to mere competition. <clears throat> what can get them out of that? The only things that, that can are being thrown in together and having to work together against another lord or against the environment that they're in, and then everything breaks down once again, um, or forming attachments. And this is where the familial stuff can play a role, as it did in earlier books, or love can play a role, or some sort of ideals. That's the only thing that can really transport lords out of their, as, as she calls, as, as uh, uh, Anana calls it, uh, and Kikaka calls it at a certain point, not just egoistic, 
but almost solipsistic way of being. So that, that's a good theme to end upon. Um, we finished the series with Kikaka and Anana being you know, brought back together after all these trials and travails, after so much death, destruction, and in effect saving the universe from Red Orc as well as from uh, other forces, and winding up again in the world of tears, Kikaka's world. 